And so I want to encourage you today maybe to be turning over in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. I talked last week about uh, uh, why we give an invitation every week. You know, in this series of messages, we simply entitled, you know, why do we do what we do every week? Uh, we talked about worship. We've talked about praise. We've talked about, uh, you know, having sermons. And we talked about having offerings. These are for many of you maybe refreshers from a few years ago as we talked about uh, why do we get the, we don't want to get sucked into a pattern of just doing something for the sake of doing it, but we want to know that God's working in our lives and he's getting us to the ultimate destination, trying to get us home. Uh, and, and, and I'm loving the stories, believe it or not, that I'm hearing from people who have been in the places where folks are uh, recuperating and recovering from storms uh, because what I'm hearing is that God is at work. Uh, his church has been actively participating uh, with ministries and, and other uh, lives of families, and they're coming together, and they're, they're trying to help. Just this week, I, I shared about the Lowland Church of Christ, and they flooded, and, and they just recuperated just from a few years ago from a flood. Now they've, they've got to go through the whole process, and then Looking at what was going on, they determined, uh, Rella Sam says after they walked through the building, they realized, uh, yeah, they could get, get back to that place where maybe they, they could begin to worship in the, in the old building that they had one day, but financially it just wasn't going to be feasible. They could take it down and eventually invest those funds uh, into raising the building, a newer building, and having it high enough because uh, where the Lowland Church of Christ sits, it's three feet above sea level. <laughs> now, I want you to think about this, and the church is sitting on the highest point on the island. And when it floods, that means all the people have gone through those kind of things as well. Now, what are you talking about that for? We, we want to talk about why we need to be baptized every week. I mean, you know, somebody asked me last week, said, but is it important that people get baptized? And the Bible is going to teach about that because one day uh, God's not going to wipe the world out again with another flood. He says he's going to just destroy it. It's going to obliterate it. It's going to burn it. Even the rocks are going to melt away, he says. Now, that's a hot heat. And so what do we do to, do, to escape that? We need to be prepared. And last week, I, uh, I was, this week, I was going to talk about church membership. And somebody said, well, you mentioned baptism, and, uh, but is it really that important? And, and I just want to share with you, it's really that important. Uh, you know, it, it's important for people to be baptized, that's the reason uh, we, we come together every week. That's the reason we come and preach Jesus. That's the reason we want to teach you who Christ is. We want you to see your life to be transformed because of who uh, Jesus is. And, and he laid out the plan, and all he asked for you and I to do is to follow the plan. And so as we walk through this message this morning, I want us to just have an open heart to what he has to say to us. A little boy in his Sunday school class told his teacher, he says, Hey, next Sunday, I'm getting baptized. Uh, I just, I'm excited about it. And the teacher says, wow, so that is great. I'm so happy for you. We're just, the whole class was excited for him and they cheered him on. And he says, I'm going to wear goggles <laughs> when I get baptized. And he says, this teacher was like, she was like, well, I just can't let that go. I want to know why he wants to wear goggles. He says, you don't like get water in his eyes or what the case is. So they said, well, do you, you can't get the water? You don't like water? You just close your eyes. He said, no, I want to see my sins washing away. <laughs> the preacher says, my sins wash away. And, and, and you know, when we, we think about things that take place in, in, in life and we think about it in the church, we, we have questions. Uh, children often have the very simple, straightforward way of viewing things, don't they? And, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. And as I mentioned about the storm and the devastation that's taking place, what are we hearing? We're hearing about stories where people are just getting back to the basics. We're not trying to cloud it up with too much junk. We just want to know... How did God put me in this world, and how does he want me to survive it, and how does he want me to live with my fellow man, and how is he trying to get me home? And for many of us, we, as we get older, we just cloud things up and we complicate it. Life gets so complicated. And even when we get to thinking about our relationship with Christ, we'll say things like, well, I'm a Christian, but is baptism really that important? Or if someone dies who hasn't been baptized, what's going to happen to them? And I, I say, that's the great thing about the grace of God. I don't have to make that determination. I just preach and teach what the scriptures say and let God be the one who finally makes the decisions. 
And today we'll just try to shed some light on the matter of baptism as, as to why it's so closely tied to our salvation. Now, baptism with it, being baptized today, if you were to walk forth and say, well, look, I'm just going to get baptized. I, I don't want this Jesus character. Uh, I, I'm not really looking to change my life. I, I, I don't really want to give up the sin that's in my life. I want to just do what I've been doing. But if that's going to help it, let's buy a little fire insurance today. And, 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 and when the time comes, I've got it. And that's not going to save you. It's going to take this relationship with Jesus. But baptism is important, and we need to do it, and we teach people to do it, as I mentioned before, because baptism is all about death. In Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, it says these words. Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. I mean, in order to be a Christian, you have to die. That's what the Bible is going to teach us. No matter what, no matter what uh, church tradition you come out of, to, everybody's going to say you've got to be born again. But to be born again means what? You've got to get rid of something. You've got to die to something. You have to die to the old way of life. In Romans chapter 6, verse 2, it says, We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Romans 6 says, verse 6, for we know uh, that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be a slave to sin. Notice what takes place. Boy, if you crucify somebody, it's not very often they just take them down and say, okay, we crucified you, you're free to go now. Crucifixion means something had to die and someone had to die. The theme's repeated in Colossians chapter 3. It says in Colossians 3, 3, it says, For you died. And your life is now hidden in Christ, with Christ in God. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 says, here's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we also live with him. A trustworthy saying. <laughs> Means you can, you, can, you can bank on this one. You can hang your hat on it, as Papa West used to say. You can hang your hat on that. It's going to be stable. It ain't going to fall. Here's a trustworthy statement. And again and again in the New Testament, we're told that in order to belong to Jesus, we have to die. Isn't it amazing? And yet, that's what Jesus demonstrated for us on the cross, wasn't it? For in order for us to be with him, something has to die. And so, God sends his son. And baptism is just a way of driving that truth home. I mean, what do you do with bury, uh, dead people? You bury them. Some people get cremated. We won't go there right now. But for the most part, you're going to bury dead people. It's a reminder to, that, 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 that our past is now gone. Whatever was once living is no longer here. And, and, and some churches try to make the, their congregation believe that baptism can be done by pouring or sprinkling or water on someone's head. And that's okay if that's what they want to do. And you don't have to do it any other way. But... If, if you were to think about that for a minute or two, how much sense would it really make if we, we applied that to a physical death? Now, I mean, let's just say I, I die this afternoon. Amy's already looking for the insurance policies now. She said, now, where do you put those insurance policies? But just say I die this afternoon, and they take my body down to the funeral home, uh, and, and they prepare it for burial. And then at the funeral, you're all going to come. You're all going to show up. You're going to cry and cry. And you're going to cry. You're going to really miss me. You're going to cry. <laughs> and then after the funeral, and all the words have been spoken over my body that's no longer living, uh, they're going to carry me to the cemetery. And they're going to place my casket in a grave. And what's going to happen? Are they just going to take a little handful of dirt and sprinkle over the top of my casket or maybe open it and, and sprinkle a little handful over my head and say, well, we buried him, let's go on. You know what Jesus, you know what the folks told Jesus when he went to Lazarus, didn't he? He said, oh, it's been three days, he rolled away the stone. And, and then the King James says, no, he stinketh. By now he stinketh. Or would they maybe lay my casket in the hole and, and they grab the shovel and just throw a couple of shovels and say, look, that's close enough. You know, dirt's dirt, you know. It, it's going to work out. 
no, they're going to bury me. They're going to cover me up. But, you know, because you just don't leave, you don't leave dead stuff laying around. I mean, if they're going to dig a hole six foot deep to place somebody in, they're going to fill it up, aren't they? Romans 6 tells us that we were buried with Christ, that we, we, we were buried with him, and, and that's why water baptism also involves a lot of water. You know, when, when we were buried with Christ, that means that there has to be something dying. Something's got to be covered up. In, in, in John chapter 3, we see in verse 23, now John the Baptist, he, he said, was also baptizing at, at Anon near Salem. Says, and, and here's what took place, because there was plenty of water. And the people were constantly coming to be baptized. Now, you got to understand, this was before the church was instituted. This is before that Jesus institutes the church and, and, and he ascends back into heaven and, and Peter's preached the first sermon on the day of Pentecost that I referred to last week. This is before that time. And even then, John is preaching repentance. And for whatever reason, the people says, I've got to get this junk off my life. And so God is using baptism even at that time as a way of people having their sins and demonstrating repentance. In John chapter 3, if you want to read all about it, you find that's also where Jesus is baptized. And while he's there, and he's in this river, and, uh, and, and, and John's down there baptizing people, Jesus walks up, and John says, Whoa, I can't baptize you. You need to baptize me. And he says, No, it can't happen that way. You know why? You go back and read it. Jesus says it has to be done so that it can fulfill all righteousness. Uh, this has to be done. Jesus was a sinless person. He was the perfect one. He's the one that we come in every week and we worship and we give our lives to and we come around the table and we remember. And even he says it has to be done to fulfill all righteousness. And when he went down into the water, the Bible says, and when he comes up out, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. You get in a picture of what takes place in yours. And the Father from heaven looks down and he says, this is my son who I'm well pleased. You listen to him. And he says the same about you and I. Gives us his Holy Spirit. He, he says, I'm pleased with this person. This child is mine. Acts chapter 8, we find Philip and the eunuch. In verses 38 and 39, it talks about the Ethiopian eunuch and his baptism. It says, both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, so we realize there's a lot of waters being used here. The Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went away rejoicing. Now, there's no sense in going down into the water and coming up out of the water if Philip simply could have said, well, here, you got some drinking water here in your canteen while we travel along. Now that he's been teaching him about Jesus, let me just sprinkle over this water over top of your head. No, he says we had to stop. You see, baptism requires a lot of water because it represents a physical death and a burial. But there's even more than that. If you were to come forward this morning at the end of the service, you say, I want to profess Christ as my Savior, and we baptize you into Christ, we're going to lower you into this baptistry. It's considered like a watery grave. But, but do I leave you there? For some, probably say, we need to leave them a little bit longer. My dad used to say, just hold them down until they bubble. But for the most part, no, we're going to take you up out of there. Jimmy Tickle, when he baptizes the kids, he always wants it to be, uh, especially for some of them, he wants it to uh, be something they'll always remember. So when he holds them down, he bumps them on the bottom. But that's something they'll always remember. But then you're raised up out of this watery grave. And basically, it's symbolizing that you have been raised from the dead. So the second thing we find out then is when we've been baptized in Christ, not only is it about death, it's also about life. That's part of the genius of God. I'm still trying to figure him out. And the more I learn about him, the more I feel like I want to sit in the corner with a dunce hat on, the less it seems I know about him. He designed our baptism not only to represent our death, but also, it reassures us that one day, we're going to rise from the dead. 
In Romans chapter 6, verse 4, that's what Romans, it tells us. He says, we were therefore buried with him through baptism in the death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Repeatedly, over and over in the scriptures, people were baptized immediately upon making their decision to follow Jesus. Acts 16 talks about this businesswoman named Lydia. And she's down by the riverside, and basically they're having Bible study with some other ladies. And Paul comes along as they're studying, and he begins to preach to them. That's what most preachers are going to do. You hear somebody talking about Bible study or something. We're going to say, oh, that's right up my alley. Let me talk about that a little while. But as a result of what he was teaching her, he baptizes her because he teaches her about Jesus. On the day of Pentecost, Peter talks to a large crowd of people there in Jerusalem. And he says, though he's speaking to thousands and thousands of people, it says 3,000 people responded to the message. And he didn't wait a few days or even, boy, this is a lot of folks. Let's, let's sit around and organize this thing. Let's figure out what we're going to do. Let's figure out where we can hold it. We don't want to... We don't want these uh, Romans and stuff to see us. We don't want the Jews to get mad with us. Uh, so let's find a good secluded place to do it in private. No, they did it that day. It says that day that they were baptized. Acts 8 again with this eunuch as he's traveling home in his chariot. This man is studying the book of Isaiah. He's picked up this scroll, which was not like you and I running out to Ollie's or down to the Christian bookstore or to Walmart. So I think I need a new Bible. You do that often. We pick them up pretty regular. Uh, these were hard to come by. They were handwritten. And, and he's come to Jerusalem. Obviously, he's heard about God. He's a God-fearing person. And he's reading the scroll of Isaiah, and it talks about how Jesus was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And he says, I don't understand who he's talking about. And God tells Philip to come alongside the chariot, and he goes, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how could I unless somebody explains it to me? And he says, he begins to pick up that very passage, and he tells them about Jesus. Now, in anything you read in the book of Acts, you don't read anything about what he says. Well, here's where Jesus says you got to do this. And here's, but from what he was teaching, he says, well, wait a minute. We come up to a large body of water. In Acts chapter 6, Acts 8, verse 36, it says, as they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the unit says, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? That's the first time you even hear mention about their account together that he's even talked about baptism. Philip has not mentioned it, but somehow in the teaching, he understands this must take place. And they stop the chariot. Philip baptizes them at that very moment when, when they stop to go down into the water. And then the Holy Spirit takes them away. There's, there's been a few times you've said, I wish he'd carry you away. You go along sometime. But then in Acts 16, it tells us about Paul and Silas. They had been arrested for preaching about Jesus. In verses 26 through 33, we read these words. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. We often overlook that part. They're not telling them to shut up. They're not telling them, you Christian fanatics, or whatever the case is. They said they're listening to them. And suddenly there was a, such a, a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And at once the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. And in those days, if you lost a prisoner, you exchanged your life for theirs. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself, we're all here. The jailer called for lights. He rushed in, and he fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? How did that come to that? Because he'd been listening to the hymns and the songs that had been singing about God. And they replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and, and, and to all the others in his house. And at that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and his family were baptized. The latest I think I've ever baptized anybody is right at midnight. Just happened. First person ever baptized. It was almost midnight. One schedule. Talking about somebody else. He's talking about his son and, and some concern he has for him. And in talking about his son and questions he has about the Bible because he don't know much. He's talking to me who I don't know much, but it seems like I knew more than he did at the time. 
And in, in our conversation, he says, am I saved? I said, well, that's going to be between you and God. And he looked me in the eye, and he says, I'm not saved. What do I need to do? And we prayed. And I said, just ask God to forgive you for your sins. And I'm not a preacher at the time. I'm a deacon in the local church. I don't even know if it's right for me to baptize people. And, and, uh, and, and, but in reading one of these same passages, as we talked about it, he says, well, I, what do I need to do now? So the Bible says you need to be baptized. I said, why don't you come to go to church with me tomorrow? We'll tell James about it, which is a minister, and he'll baptize you. He says, why can't I do it now? I've got a swimming pool in the backyard. Can't you do it? And I said, well, I, I guess I can. The first person I ever baptized. God just put him in my life, and I wasn't. I went expecting one thing, and God did something else in my life. And again and again in Acts, we find people who were baptized immediately upon believing in Jesus. Why? Because you don't leave dead bodies laying around. Once people have, have been willing to give up their old life, and that person has to die, you have to bury them. So why do churches wait? Why don't they baptize people right away? I mean, well, it could be that they wait because they don't believe baptism is really involved in our salvation process. But for the first 1,500 years of the church, uh, you know, it, as it existed, everyone taught that baptism was a part of the salvation act. Early church leaders would teach this. Matter of fact, Justin Martyr was one of the first century teachers. And he says these words. We have learned from the apostles this reason for baptism in order that we may obtain in the water the remission of our sins. Tertullian says these words. The act of baptism is carnal in that we are plunged in the water, but the effect is spiritual in that we are freed from sin. Now, this was consistent in the teachings of the church until the 1500s when a reformer named Zwingli comes around, and then he begins to teach a little differently from a man's perspective instead of God's perspective. And yet the Bible teaches us in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, for all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You know, it's getting cold weather this morning. You come out, maybe even Trey said he had a pair of shorts on. And he came out, he said, oh, it's kind of chilly out here today. You know what you normally do when it gets chilly? You put on long pants. You put on a jacket. You, you don't go and say, well, I've been clothed with shorts, but I want to be warm. You begin to dress accordingly, don't you? And so it is, if you want to be with Jesus, you have to clothe yourself with Jesus. First Peter chapter 3, verse 21, I've baptized a number of people, and I talk about this as a, uh, with folks who have, who, who have been baptized again. Maybe they were baptized as an infant or a child, or they weren't quite understanding why they were baptized the first time. And, and I said, well, here's the reason some people, as they get older, as they get understanding opens up, maybe it would justify them being baptized. And this water, Noah's flood, symbolizes baptism that now saves you also. Not the removal of dirt from the body, can't help that, but the pledge of a good conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, if wait a minute, if I'm saved by the grace of God through faith, how does that happen? The truth is you're saved by God's grace through your faith in Him. That's what's going to take place. All these other things are going to be as a result of your faith in Christ and God's grace being shed on your life. You see, our faith shows us and it shows up in our life through our repentance of sin. We're going to, God, I don't want to keep living this way. I need to stop my life and I want it to change. And so as a result of that, what do we need to do? I need to confess Jesus as my Lord and allow him, allow, allow him to come into my life. And then I'm allow myself to be buried in the water of baptism. Why? Because I want that washed away. But the great thing about it is it doesn't stop there. Even though he takes the sin away, he doesn't leave us empty. He gives us his Holy Spirit. And baptism is an expression of our faith. Colossians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Having been buried with him in baptism and raised through, uh, with him through your faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Faith is also, and, and baptism work hand in hand when we consider what he, we read in Mark chapter 16. 
In verse 16, it says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. In other words, unless I believe what my baptism means and I believe in the one who says it's necessary for me, then the baptism itself means nothing. And so it has to be for the believer. So that's the reason we don't baptize infants and little children because they don't know exactly what they believe. You have to make the choice to follow. So to be merely baptized without faith, repentance, and confession of Jesus is just to get wet. But to believe baptism isn't a part of the process is to be counter to what the scriptures are teaching. Now, God has something that's his, and it's called salvation. He, he's paid for it with his own blood. There, there's, there's no way I can ever repay uh, the loan he gave me with a, one drop of blood of Jesus. It's, I can't do it, no matter what I do. But in order for us to accept his free gift, he's asked us to respond by, first of all, believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, repenting of our sins, confessing Jesus as our Lord and our Master, being buried with him in the watery grave of baptism. But then he says you get to rise to the newness of life. And then he wants us to live lives for him. Now, let's just say someone comes forward at the invitation. They say, well, look, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. I want to be, I want to repent of my sins. But I don't want to let Jesus be Lord of my life every day. I like my life. I like some of the things that I'm taking part in. And I know that it, if I read in the Bible, it's going to tell me that I need to make some changes. So that's not the part that I want. But I do want Jesus. I need a Savior. I do want to repent of some of my sin, but not all of my sin, and, and because I want to continue to live my life the way that... Now, what that man is doing is offering God a counteroffer to his offer of salvation. God's got a choice. He can accept it or not. That's up to him. He's God. I'm not. The only thing I can go off of is what he's written down for me. I have to go by his plan. We confront it all the time. Well, you read in the scriptures and where God says something. He says, yeah, but that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. You're like, whoa, it was a long time ago. But if I go back and read history, I could say the same thing. That was a long time ago. Do you really want to say we got to keep doing that? That was a long time ago. Who never changes? The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. The one thing that I have to remain constant in my life with is his word. When, when everything else constantly changes on a regular basis, you go out to the college here and you take a class and go to psychology. You get to thinking about it and they talk about how uh, former ways of teaching or thought processes used to think this way. But now we understand it. This is the terminology they're using in textbooks. But now we understand it to be, well, whose understanding changed? Have we got new, new ev evidence? Do we have new revelation? Whose understanding has changed along the way? Not God. He stayed the same. So who has changed? Man's mind, mind has changed. And the only thing I can do, if you were to come to me and say, well, look, I want Jesus. I, I, I want to be saved, but I, I, I want this free offer of salvation. Uh, you know, but... but I just want it on my terms, not his. You work that out with him. The only thing that I can do is tell you what he says in his word. You see, what happens to me if I, as an agent of God, as a minister of the gospel, told you, uh, you do it your way, God's going to be happy. Let me share with you what he tells me in his word as he speaks to me. James chapter 3, verse 1. Not many of you should presume to be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. So I could say, well, that's fine. If that's the way you want it, let's do it your way. But you know what's going to happen? 
now not only do I stand before God for my sin, now I stand before God for your sin. Because I did not tell you his way. I told you your way. You see, God expects those of us who teach and preach to to know the Bible well enough to avoid the misleading characteristics that are taking place in the world around us. We had the conversation this past week. The passage of Scripture plainly says something. And somebody says, well, even if you mean it in good fun, you're saying it's not okay? I said, that's not what God said. He said, don't do this. So if he said don't do it, even though I'm doing it in jest or in good fun, does that make it okay? No. Because then he tells me to be careful in my jesting, that I do not sin. You you understand what I'm getting at? So so to make light of a a command, a a direct word of God, to say, well, I, I don't really believe it. I'm just going along with it because it helps me fit into the crowd you know, then I sin against the Lord. The scripture says, a person who knowingly does what they know that they shouldn't do is sinning. But those who do not act and carry out the things that though they didn't actually do anything wrong, but they knew the right thing to do, they're sinning as well. And when it comes down to it, because I was baptized for the remission of sin and gift of the Holy Spirit, I stand before him, just as you will. And I have to choose. God, will I still let you be God? Or will I take your place and take you off your throne? What about you? Wouldn't you love to know that everything that you've ever done would be washed away? Uh, Wouldn't you love to know that it had been buried forever, that that it will never show up again? I mean, now, we might remember something, but God says, I can take it away. It will disappear if you want it to disappear just that much. But you must be willing to allow it to happen. For those of us who have been baptized into Christ, all those things can be taken care of by simply repenting of our sins because we've been baptized into Christ. We've received the Holy Spirit. But for those who have never accepted Christ on His terms, who have never been baptized into Christ for His terms, then we have to be willing to have those removed and washed away. So where do you find yourself? Do you find yourself in this great chasm as we see in Luke chapter 16? Two people were in different walks of life, but they found themselves in the same place when it came to it. One had grown up all his life. He'd been a poor person. The reason I know he was a poor person, because he's still a poor person. He's a beggar laying at a rich man's gate. He was never able to do anything for himself. If he grew up in an affluent family, he would have had something. So I found out he was probably been poor all his life. Another person who had had everything that he had ever wanted, dressed in the finest clothes, ate the best food. He ate so good that even the beggar wanted to eat crumbs that rolled off his table. But he never got it. They both die. And when they look up, they see both of them are there with Abraham. But there's this chasm in between. For one, he's laying in Abraham's bosom, lean back as a good friend, the person who loved him and cared for him. Uh, They would lean back on one another and just hang out with each other. He's leaning back, the poor man is. But the rich man who was so tied up in his own self all his life and would never see anything other than what he wanted right at the very moment, he lifts his eyes up and sees that he's in hell. What is a difficult picture to imagine, isn't it? When he looks over and he sees Abraham there and he sees Lazarus, you know what he says? He says, Abraham, would you send him to dip his finger in that water just so he could touch the tip of my tongue? Boy, that's wanting to drink, isn't it bad? You know what he says? He says, all all this can't happen that way. He said, all all his life said he never got the good things. You had all the good things you ever wanted, but this man never had anything. And even though he wanted, in his mind, he wanted just a crumb that fell off your table, you never gave him anything. He says, but besides all that, he can't go over there. He said, well, at least send him back to where my brothers are and tell them about it. 
He says, I've got five brothers. And he said, if they're just like me. If they don't change, they don't repent, they're going to end up in this. And I don't want them to come here. He says, look, they got Moses and the prophets. And I want you to go, you hang on that. They got Moses and the prophets. They got the word. Let them hear then. They didn't say it changed. Didn't say anything was going to be any different. Because we now understand it different. They had Moses and the prophets. He says, and if they won't listen to them, they wouldn't believe that somebody would come back from the dead. God simply tells us we need to be baptized as part of the salvation process. When you're asking me, why do you baptize people? I said, well, because God tells me in his word. It's part of the connection we're going to have, the the removal of sin uh, from our life and, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what are you going to do? Ignore it or go through with it? If I talk, teach about forgiveness of sin, I must also teach about the Holy Spirit. And if I teach about the Holy Spirit, I must teach about baptism because God says that's where it comes connected. And so as we get ready to stand and sing, where do you find yourself? Have you made the right choice? Are you following the way God wants you to go? Or are you still trying to go the way that you chose? Or maybe somebody else told you. You have to come to the light. God, am I walking in your plan? Am I working with you along your terms, or am I still trying to get you to work within mine?